Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. A little over a month ago, I went to a clinic at Daisy Haven Farm in Pennsylvania, taught by Daisy Bicking. I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot and got to meet some great people. I've had a handful of people ask me about the clinic, so I decided to do a short teaser episode for what the clinic was like. Hopefully it gives you a glimpse into some of the things we learned there and the dynamic of the clinic itself. Oh, it's a really horrible one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't tell me that. Hey, I brought that one too low to the ground. Fun. Okay. I, I think it's, it's making me really sad. Really yeah. So you want to just more. Yeah. Yeah. At the clinic, we were able to spend time chatting with other horse owners and hoof care providers in between the class style of Daisy teaching us. It was very discussion based, so often Daisy would introduce a concept and allow us to ask questions or even discuss horses we work on with similar issues. So you have phalangeal rotation, so that's that broken forward hoof pattern axis. Then you have capsular rotation, which is the bone rotating away from the capsule, okay? So those are two completely different things. And you can have some of that in a lot of different scenarios. Some horses with big flares will get capsular rotation, okay? They may not have phalangeal rotation, but they might have capsular rotation, okay? So it's important to think, to me, I'm thinking about this joint and the bone balancing this way, and then I'm thinking about that capsule being centered around the joint, around the, the internal structures. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm-hmm. Is that giving you a picture of how I'm looking at balance? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different because guess what? I trim the bottom of that foot asymmetrically all the time. And we're taught symmetry on the sole side, symmetry, 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 right? And I trim them asymmetrical all the time because I'm trying to solve problems barefoot mm-hmm. that I know if I did it in a shoe, I would do it a little differently, but then I've learned I can do these things barefoot you know, for most horses and it's okay. So, you know, I might trim over trim one side of the foot or leave the wall longer on one side than the other a little bit. And it really helps them. This all comes from Dave Duckett, Rick Redden, Gene Oakman is where all this comes from. That four point trim idea is, is where this idea of hoof mapping came from. And I look at feet a lot on a four point idea. So I look at two heel points and two toe points. And I look at All of my balance is based on those four points and balancing them the way that I want the coffin bone to interact with the ground. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're looking at your toe pillars there in the corners. And then it used to be we would talk about this balance in a one third, two thirds. So when Dr. Balker talks about one third, two thirds, this is what he's talking about. Because we used to measure from the frog apex to the breakover, and then you'd want two thirds of that behind and one third in front. The problem with that is that the frog apex migrates Mm -hmm. and it distorts. So you can have a horse where that frog apex, especially since he says never touch the frog, and the frog runs forward, a lot of times the first thing I do is just do a very light tidy up of the frog apex so it doesn't make me think the toe is shorter than it actually is. Because if that distance from the frog apex to the end of the toe is only this long, are you going to bring that toe back? No, not, not, not if you're measuring from there. No. But on the other hand, what if it's just that the frog apex is run that far forward and the bone is actually this far back? You actually have a lot of toe. The discussions were probably my favorite part. I think it really helped us all to learn from each other. I personally have an education background. I was a teacher in a public school for nine years, so I really appreciated Daisy's thoughtful approach to teaching. Sometimes the clinic got a little off topic, but each time it led to good discussion of things we as hoof care providers often see day in and day out. Clearly, pathology is structural and functional manifestations of a disease. Why do we get cracks? I'll talk about that for a second. Why do we get cracks? I don't know. Different diet, diet issues, yes. excess leverage, coffin bone loss. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> Nutrition, mm-hmm. right? Lack of exercise. Imbalance in the trim or how the horse loads its foot, right? Which what else? Start out as Some can be environmental issues. So, um, so environment like um, what? What wet and things like that. Wet to dry. Yeah, or right. Okay. Absolutely yeah. trainer. Like Trauma, mm-hmm. right? So you have infection, diet, imbalance. And trauma. That's it. There's your differential diagnosis for a crack. 
But you got to know why you have it to get rid of it, right? Okay. So all of those things are not distortions. I mean, imbalance in the trim, yes, but it's still a trauma. Do you see what I'm saying? But wouldn't imbalance in the trim be a, dis a, dis a distortion leading to a pathology? Correct. So this pathology right. manifests as distortion some. Well, okay, so that's why you have the next page. Look at the second page with the Venn diagram. The hardest part to convey in this podcast episode is how visual Daisy's clinic is. She has slides of pictures and radiographs for countless pathology cases she has worked on. We were able to first talk about what we might do for the case, and then Daisy showed us what she did. There she was, I mean, look what she's doing in the back. She's almost standing on top of herself, and then she's leaning horribly. I mean, she just was full of compensations. I mean, can you see her neck is off to the mm -hmm. left? Because she's trying to, she's trying not to fall over on the right, mm -hmm. left leg. Her neck is off to the right, if we flip mm -hmm. her around. Her neck is off to the right because she's trying to not lean over the left leg. So what I did to her is I lowered the medial side and then I eased the breakover on the lateral toe pillar. Hmm. She could roll over it. So she could roll over it because that's where she needed to break over was the lateral toe pillar. So lower the medial and then ease that lateral toe pillar. It's this way. So lower the medial, ease that lateral toe pillar. So what it did is it is it brought the leg out more and then but she could still break over the lateral toe pillar. So you've got height to bring that leg back under, right? And then you've got the breakover location. So those are two different things. On the horse yesterday, what did I do? I raised the medial side and the medial toe pillar, but then eased the breakover on the lateral side, which is essentially the, the opposite. No, the so opposite. you said this, didn't you say to shorten the medial and ease the? the yeah, I, I raised the medial on that. Oh, you other raised because oh, right, we wanted right, the lateral to right, be functionally I, okay. shorter. Somehow I got tangled up in my head. It's, right. it's re you see why it's really hard to draw rotational deformity. Daisy also passed out handouts and worksheets for us to practice our x-ray vision and ability to see distortion and pathology in the foot. Right? But what I realized was intuitively isn't enough when you come across a foot that doesn't make sense to you. Then you've got to have it more clear and more defined, especially when you're learning. But this really helps me now because I go up and I'm like, all right, this foot's funky. There's a lot of different things going on this foot. And I have a couple case studies that we didn't get to I want to show you this morning that are confusing. That I want to show you where this really becomes practically important. Okay? So when you talk about that heel downturning, it's very <coughs> clear in my mind that absolutely that's a distortion that goes with a, a failure of the back of the foot. And no, yeah, you guys probably know most of this stuff intuitively. But isn't it great to have it clearly defined in a checklist, okay? Now, what happened was, in my head, I have all these distortions, like out here in space. Okay, think about like this big thought bubble above my head, right? You guys picturing it? <laughs> okay, now, you walk up to a foot and you're like grabbing them. Ooh, this one's happening and this one's happening. Not everybody works like that, okay? Some people are way more concrete learners. I'm very much of a intuition, feel, sort of, you know, get a, get a gist of it, <coughs> get some concrete things to back up my gut feeling and run with it person. But a lot of people are like, no, if you have this and you have that, then it equals this, right? Who's like that? Anybody know about that, about themselves? Yeah, Andrew's like, me! Yeah, okay. So. I like to be that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We spent time learning how to better read radiographs as well, and what to look for in podiatry radiographs. Do you, what do you think about this after x-ray? Well, the after x-ray definitely shows that, that the bone on the medial side is missing bone, so you're not going to put that back. Right. And so you have to just, um, you know, wow. do what you can to, to comp compensate for that. Now, uh, the other side of this I'll tell you is that the vet took this x-ray straight to the bone and not straight to the pastern. Can you see the difference in the two different mm -hmm. x-rays? Because doesn't the, so who was it that commented that his leg was still on, <coughs> right? And I said that's confirmational. So this, this is actually how crooked it is in the other x-ray. It's just we're seeing it more straight on. But I almost think the foot growth may have interfered with the balance at this point. Like where the foot growth happened and then now 
you almost would have to modify, like then go in and modify to get a better mm -hmm. arrangement. Daisy had about 60 cadaver feet for us to play with too. So we were able to take radiographs, trim the cadavers we each chose, and radiograph them again after to see what changes we made to the internal structures and bone alignment. We then presented our cadaver legs with before and after radiographs to discuss as a group. Vanna, a foot. So we go get a foot. So, so Claire has a foot here. Okay. Up and running is number 36. That's Who's mine? I'm 36. Okay. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to give us a brief synopsis of what the foot looked like when you started, like your distortions and your palmar angle and all that stuff on your paper. Okay. Then once you get through that, tell us the goal <coughs> in your plan was and we'll look at your radiograph and we'll decide if your assessment was accurate and then what your goal and your plan was, we'll look at the after radiograph and see how much you achieved that and what happened with the trim balance. Okay. okay? Daisy does a lot of glue-on work, so we did spend a good amount of time discussing glue-on options and watching the glue-on process in full with an Impona style shoe as well as the Easy Care Performance shoe. Most of these clinics also allow everyone to then each glue a shoe onto a cadaver foot. If you trim a foot, and you leave that nice wall all the way around the quarters, and then you shoe it full, you're doing nothing except create excess leverage, because the taller something gets, the more leverage you're adding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because the lever arm is longer, the taller the foot gets mm -hmm. at the ground surface, okay? So you've got to think with glue-on application, <coughs> if you're going to do that, you've got to think that you're adding height, you're adding length which is why I set my shoes back so far. Mm -hmm. Because you're adding all that height. If I just shoe them full of the toe, I'm, I'm getting rid of all the benefit of my short toe. Yeah. Okay? So the same goes medial lateral. Okay? In this example, they're looking at, say, a flat shoe versus a, 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 round, a half round shoe, right? A rounded shoe. That the, the concave shoe gives some kind of leverage reduction just by the fact that the edges aren't corners. So I just take that idea even further, and when I shoe, I shoe to the white line, and then I bevel the ground surface. So I'm basically making a clog, mm. okay? One really interesting part of the clinic was hearing Dr. Judith Shoemaker talk about postural rehabilitation, as well as the connection between feet and teeth. She also went into discussion about various therapies she offers, such as Beamer therapy and ozone treatment. We were able to see her work on a laminitic pony. Overall, it was great to have a vet there with alternative treatment options. Talk about the horse's posture. Did you guys get the definition of posture? Mm -hmm. Posture is the, the relationship of bones to one another and to down, okay? And to perpendicular with the center of the earth. We talked a little bit about horizon lines. Yeah, horizon lines are important because that's the default for animals, if they've got screwed up mechanisms for keeping their balance, they eventually can go to the horizon line or to surfaces of water or to fence rails and they'll use what are called their vestibular, you know, their balance mechanism in their inner ear, vestibulo-ocular reflexes, eye and balance mechanism reflexes to figure out where down is. Okay? Now, the upper cervical writing mechanisms are the keeping your brain stem from having an unceremonious meeting with the ground. <laughs> you know, keep your cockpit flying straight, <laughs> flat, and level, okay? Keeping the cockpit flying straight, flat, and level are the most global reflexes in the whole system. They govern everything. And why is that? So you say upper cervical writing mechanisms. You're talking about cervical. You're talking about up here in your... <laughs> upper neck. Upper neck. So that's your upper cervical writing mechanism or your stomatic nathic system. <laughs> nice word. I have to practice hard to be able to say <laughs> I'd have to practice hard. Stomatic nathic system. What that just means the stomach, <laughs> the mouth, and the teeth. The stomatic nathic system input. So that just shows you that, you know, hey, my back didn't loosen up. So you got a horse that got an overbite. Is he going to have a hollow back? Possibly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Is it going to get better with your shoeing? If you get his feet spread out, yeah, it might be. But you got a lot of horses that get hollow backs and kissing spines, a whole boatload of other things, because their teeth aren't right. And you can get them standing up nice and straight, and their backs will still be hollow, they'll still be sore, still will get kissing spines. So you got to have a great fence. Yep. So, I mean, really, there are two of them. We're going to show you both of these reflexes. You can help horses with this and do this. You don't want to be adjusting horses unless you are adjusting horses, you know, properly from, you know, got the education and licenses and all that kind of stuff. But there are certainly things you can do to make them better and help your, and, and keep you from getting your head kicked off, too. Mm. So, very important to know some of these things. But the biggest thing that you've got to realize is that the best therapist that you've got going for you is gravity. It's what? Gravity. Gravity. It'll either help you or ruin your process. And if you see signs that an animal's relationship with gravity, which is its posture, are inappropriate, and your shoeing or trimming doesn't change it, then you need to get hold of the rest of your professional team. If barrier part of it is super, super important, but it does take also, of course, a veterinarian and it takes a dentist. And to a certain extent, it takes a rider and a handler, but you know, a lot of horses survive bad riding and bad handling extremely well if everything else is in order. Mm -hmm. But we want to take a look and see what is going on. Yep. There was a lot more that we heard and saw and did at the clinic that I just wouldn't have time to put into a podcast. It was five days long and it was jam packed so much that we ran out of time to do everything we wanted to. I hope this episode has been helpful as a sort of sneak peek into the inner workings of a clinic at Daisy Haven Farm. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.